just everywhere I went, I was just drenched in it. I'd walk into a room and I would literally think, well, I can't do that. I'm a childhood survivor of sexual assault. Or I'd be around the person, of, oh, they don't get it. They're not a childhood survivor of sexual assault. And I started going into this identity game without even realizing it. And what I call the victim role, which sounds so harsh, I don't even like the word victim at all. Um, but that's why I like to go into the nuance of saying it's the repre it, it's the it's the frozen experience in the bones. That's really what I'm talking about here. And then we identify from that frozen experience and we live from it. And biologically, you literally feel abused all the time. Welcome to the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast, where we explore life through the lens of somatics. I'm Luis Mujica, a somatic educator who teaches people how to find safety in themselves. Your turn to learn begins now. So I'm going to open up this group chat with something I wrote in my stories a few days ago when I was reflecting on the term victim mentality. When I assume the victim role, I somatically freeze my oppression into my bones and I live from a survival response. The world is not what's against me, but rather the short-term events that were actually abusive are frozen in my joints. What's against me is my body. It's living from the expectation of threat and it's bracing against everything. It literally presses into me. And so the identity of victim becomes a biological oppression from the inside out. So I'm wanting to play with this with my team because um, it's a controversial thing to say and it might not make sense at first, but as we weave it, I think it will help people you know, land this, this notion of what I'm talking about. And we see this a lot in the course and with people around the world that we've worked with through the course where a situation has occurred and the event now gets internalized as identity. And we try to help people realize and the feeling that now practice, and I developed it for this purpose, really helps people see the difference between not that it happened or didn't happen, is it happening now? And in the question, is it happening now, we find a lot of freedom. Even when it's a daily occurrence, right? Even when we know, like hypothetically, every day at 3 p.m. this thing is going to happen. Until 3 p.m. comes, can you attune to that? It's not happening right now. That's what that's what I'm speaking about here. And so we like to, you know, quote Resma. Do you want to say it, Camille? Uh, yeah, I'm going to butcher it. Um, <laughs> I'll trauma. say it. <laughs> if you don't want it. Go ahead, you try. You trauma unmetabolized becomes identity or personality in the individual and in the Oh, I can't remember what it is for family. In the Tradition? family, it becomes a family pattern. Or family to pattern like and, and community, it becomes culture. Notice how I said I like tradition, like he didn't even say it. I just like what we're turning this yeah. into. <laughs> but that's the point. It's these unmetabolized experiences, like I was writing, they become biological. Like your bones are now expressing this experience because it's stuck in you. And then it goes into your personality and your person and you identify with it. And I noticed that the most when I was in psychotherapy for years and every therapist I worked with, I would tell them my story and each one would give me the same diagnoses and the same identities. And the one that I kept getting over and over again was childhood, a survivor of childhood sexual assault. That was like the one I kept getting, kept getting. And I noticed that I really identified with it at first because it just made so much sense. Like, well, my experiences finally made sense. And people I met with the same identity had similar things, similar issues in relationships, just so many similarities. So it was, it was initially very grounding and regulating. And then I started noticing it became outdated. It was like, I had to hear it at first, but then I noticed everywhere I went, I was just drenched in it. I'd walk into a room and I would literally think, well, I can't do that. I'm a childhood survivor of sexual assault. Or I'd be around the person of, oh, they don't get it. They're not a childhood survivor of sexual assault. And I started going into this identity game without even realizing it. And what I call the victim role, which sounds so harsh. I don't even like the word victim at all. Um, but that's why I like to go into the nuance of saying it's the repre it, it's the it's the frozen experience in the bones. That's really what I'm talking about here. And then we identify from that frozen experience and we live from it. And biologically, you literally feel abused all the time. And I felt abused all the time. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I couldn't watch certain movies. My body was constantly bracing from the abuse I experienced 15, 20 years ago because I had this really conscious identity around it. And then when I started training and working in somatics, that's when I started noticing, 
wait, the, the childhood sexual abuse is not happening right now. It's happening in my body. It's not happening in my reality. And then things started shifting like quite drastically. So where do we want to go with this? Like, how should we begin this, this piece? Well, yeah, I just want to acknowledge that like you, I, I recognize that the term victim can be really, really triggering, really activating. And so I'd even, even invite folks who are listening to this right now, even just take a moment to notice how does your body respond just to the word victim or us presencing the idea of a victim mentality? Because it's, I think there is this even just interesting to notice what is what is the immediate visceral response? Because, you know, I, I know within me and I've experienced with other people, there could be that immediate response of, but I am a victim and not out of judgment, but just out of curiosity. Notice if there's a part of you not all of you, but even just a part of you that might say, but I am. Um, that's one of the first things that, that came up for me, just noticing what comes up just at the presencing of victim or victim mentality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? When I was talking, when you were talking about identity, the thing that came up for me was when <clears throat> finding an identity or somebody giving you something that like, that for me gave me an opening into relating to myself, um, you know, or relating to other people who had been through sort of the same type of victimized thing that happened, right? And so it gave me a lot of um, safety. I think, and feeling like I wasn't alone because other people out there have been through the same thing, um, you know, or, and that I had more support and that I sort of understood myself better. But then clinging to that identity didn't help me understand myself further. It sort of closed that, <clears throat> like learning more about myself. I only learned about myself sort of through that lens for a long time, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And so, yeah, and I guess I, I never thought of myself as a victim in in some ways, and then in other ways, I, I did probably like assault or something like that. Um, but yeah, when you're talking about identity, I thought the beginning was really different than later on after I learned a lot more about other pieces of my identity. It didn't. Um, it wasn't just that. wasn't just a thing anymore. I wasn't just like a woman of color or a woman, right? Or with ADHD, that type of thing. It just sort of, instead of clinging to the one thing that I had, I felt like it's been so much better for me to expand. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And when it comes to identity too, what comes up for me is just the the fixity of it in general and how often we hold that as just, this is this one thing that will stay and pervade through my whole life, no matter the changes that happen either, you know, the ways that I changed personally, the way that my environment changed, um, and just kind of how we carry that story. And um, yeah, and, and how the the feeling that now it, it brings, I mean, it's, and I wouldn't describe it as necessarily the easiest, but I, I think in my own personal example where um, I had a lot of bullying in my childhood as well. And um, I just, uh, just how much I carry that with me and going into new places and not knowing anyone and even just, um, yeah, I'm kind of on the smaller side, just anyone who was larger than me was always like, so I was always just bracing just in public or in all these different places and how that followed me for decades and just not the way that somatics brings that in and brings the awareness of the fact that it's not even like something won't happen again. It's just that now it's not. And then slowly, you know, when am I able to kind of open and experience that it's not happening now? Because I feel like for me, it was such a, and you talk about it, we all talk about it a lot, how it's not necessarily you just open up and it's fine. And you're kind of, you know, you feel out to where it feels comfortable and you maybe you pull back in. Yeah, it's a real process. And even that snapshot you just gave us of like being bullied, being on the smaller side, going into spaces and my body bracing. That's what I was trying to get at in the, that story that I wrote. Because what um, people listening, I mean, like an Instagram story is like a beautiful, long story I wrote, but the Instagram story uh, is that piece right there is like, I'm in the room 
and I'm having a biological experience of like oppression or threats or abuse that's happening in my biology, is it happening in the space? And this is why I love somatics because it brings that nuance where we're not saying get over it. It happened 20 years ago. That's, that's one thing of like denying someone's pain. Then there's the way that we come in where it's okay. It happened. It hurts. It still hurts. And is it happening now? Like all those things exist. I wonder where, where do you go with that Camille? Um, I'm really glad we presence that because the thing that comes up for me and it, it, it comes up a lot, particularly in the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion space is this idea of gaslighting. And so many people nowadays are so quick to say, oh, you're gaslighting me. And and, and I really appreciate the the, the nuance with you and Evan, Evan shared in that it's not gaslighting because we can absolutely not, yeah, that thing happened and it sucked that it happened and it hurt you and it's still hurting you. And we just want to notice, is it happening right now? And is your body responding as if it's happening right now? And so that is the difference between, between gaslighting and really inviting someone to be present in their moment. Um, but it can feel, it can feel like gaslighting. It can feel like, like victim blaming, or it can feel like bypassing. But, there, but like we talk about a lot, there's that nuance to it. So glad you brought in gaslighting because that and narcissism are the two words people mm. love to use like the yeah. most uh, out of context, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, just like you, like if someone disagrees with someone, you're gaslighting. Me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, disagreements are not gaslighting. Mm -hmm. Saying something never happened that did happen and, and actually tricking you into believing it didn't happen, that's gaslighting. Yes. So I, I, I'm liking that you're bringing this in because when you start to say to someone, like when someone says, I'm oppressed, and I sit with them and I say, okay, like, let, let's feel that. And they tell me where they feel in their body. I'll, I'll think of like someone that comes to mind, like my shoulders, they feel in their shoulders. They feel like they've been punched in the gut. They feel like their jaw being really tight. It's like, okay, that's that. So if we even go into the work we do here about the parts instead of the identity, mm -hmm. so instead of I'm oppressed, I feel oppression in this part of my body that invites you, doesn't it, into that timeline of, okay, where is this oppress uh, oppressive biology coming from? Is it coming from my reality right now? Or is it coming from something I experienced an hour ago? Or something I think I'm going to experience an hour? Like, which mm -hmm. one's happening? And I, I wonder, you know, where, where we go with that, because it can be really, again, controversial. And people will even call it harmful to look at someone that says, you know, I'm, I'm oppressed. I'm just using that word right now. Yeah. And say, like, you're feeling that in your body right now. You're not like, like, who are we to say that? You know, where, where, how do we, how do we bring that to someone to help them? Well, I, I mean, I, I think, well, we talked about it in my perspective a bit when we talked in our last conversation around privilege and in, in sort of the terminology I use very rarely, if ever, will you hear me describe a person as privileged or describe a person as marginalized? I will say this identity has privilege or privilege, there, there are parts of their identity that, that has privilege. There are, this part experiences marginalization. So for example, yes, I experience marginalization because I'm black, autistic, a Muslim a woman, and I have privilege because I'm straight and cisgender and, and all these things. Um, but I am not necessarily privileged and I am not marginalized because again, it kind of allows for, for, for that, that nuance. It doesn't negate the fact that yes, marginalization is something that impacts my life every day, but is it impacting me every moment of every day? Not necessarily. And what type of marginalization am I experiencing can vary as well. Mm -hmm. See that piece right there is, is it happening every moment of mm -hmm. every day? That's what I want everyone listening to consider for a moment. So like earlier when Camille said, you know, when we say victim, what happens in your body? And even you presence the part that might want to fight it, the part that says like, well, no, I am. What are you talking about? I would love for us to feel that part. The part that's like, no, I am. No, it is unfair. No, I am being harmed. Like, let's like feel that part mm -hmm. because that, that interests me. What, what I guess what interests me is the the reflex to protect that part as your identity. I get really curious about that. Mm. Well, I mm, something that yeah. comes up for me 
like that part where, but, but no, I am. It's, how do I put this? This fear that we lost because I have experienced ga gaslighting. I have experienced my marginalization being suppressed or minimized or ignored. So there's this part that feels like, well, if I don't always cling to it, or if I acknowledge in this moment, I'm not experiencing marginalization, then another individual is going to say, see, I told you, you know, th that thing doesn't exist. This thing you've been talking about. So I, I, th th that is a reflect, a reflex in me. I can notice. Nice. Nice. Do you two notice that at all? Do you notice a part that reflects because no, but this is really bad that I'm dealing with, or this is something I am. Yeah, I feel like bringing in like the different, uh, I'm just noticing like the different um, levels of the experience where there's how it feels in your body. And then maybe there's how is it held in your space, like reflecting back at the quote, like how is it in the space in your family? How is it the space in the society? And kind of the story that comes up is like, well, maybe I can release that for now in the sensation that's happening in my body in my current but then it, that won't necessarily change things in the society and then the fear of well if i let this go then yeah. then what will happen mm. i think that's a big one that we see like if i let yeah. this go i'm i'm letting go of all the injustices or i'm letting go of any progress or i'm letting go of you know, anyone that needs representation including myself that's interesting to me what do you think Marika? I was thinking how for a long time as a woman, <clears throat> I very much look for evidence every day and how we collectively are being oppressed. And I had a lot of evidence, you know, and there is evidence around the world of these things happening and in my own backyard. But through somatics, it really has been, is it happening to me right now? Um, and that's, it was really helpful when Camille shared, I think the first time you ever shared um, about walking in your neighborhood Mm -hmm. and like that yes there's all these things that could potentially happen but that's not what you're attuning to mm -hmm. you're prepared but yeah. you're not attuning to that and i think that that's for me <clears throat> now I, I i i stopped following those the evidence givers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on instagram and that type of thing i still look at the news and stuff but i wasn't taking any of that evidence and making the world a better place i was just making my world a lot smaller Mm. now that's that's a great turn for us to go with. let's follow this turn that she's bringing us on around like not just looking for the evidence evidence but following the evidence bringers love that because when you say it was making my world smaller again when, whenever i hear my world i hear my body it's like because we have the world but what's my world is how i feel the world around me that's my world so when marika says makes my body smaller we think again freeze freeze response think constriction we think bracing we think tension low capacity i'm really curious about this because this is a phenomenon that a lot of us fall into again when we have these identities um if it's woman if it's person of color if it's a queer person someone's been sexually assaulted you know a republican will follow other republicans we all do it doesn't matter what the identity is what i'm curious about is like wh why do you think i have my own ideas but why do you think people want to have reflected back to them a story that makes them hurt, that makes them constrict, that makes them believe, yes, life sucks. Well, I mean, I just feel right. <laughs> Is that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of it, a small part of it. Sometimes. Yeah, no, that's a good part. That's yeah, good part. I mean, I think that there is, it is important to acknowledge that, like when you experience a form of trauma or a form of oppression or marginalization, and it has been minimized or uh, bypassed, then you see, oh, you see it too. Okay, so I'm not crazy. I think there's a, a level of that, like, okay, I'm not I'm not making this up. You're seeing the, these same patterns. And I think that is an important part. Uh, how do I say? I, I think that it serves th that level of importance. Yeah. And... I think in those same spaces where I am seeing my own experiences reflected or my own perspectives being respect reflected, there is that um, there's trauma bond going as well. Like I, I'm I'm ramped up and activated by this. You're ramped up and activated by this. Let's stay ramped up and activated together. Uh, so I think there's also that trauma bonding going on. 
that's why I was I was curious about that piece because um I think like even when Marika says I'm right, it's like there's like a dopamine hit when I mm. think I'm right. And there's also like a dopamine hit when I first start trauma bonding and then code dysregulation follows. Yes. And that's what fascinates me is I think when we talk about code dysregulation, those of you listening, we hear a lot about co-regulation. Code dysregulation is the opposite. So co-regulation is when two bodies or a group of bodies find a sense of safety in one another. So when I'm with you, something in me eases. Code dysregulation, when I'm with you, something in me braces. And if you're at a table or you're on a social media feed and you are having your own pain reflected back at you, there is this both and, it's like Camille saying, there is a, and like Marika said, I'm right. This does happen. I'm not crazy. And there's like a relief there. And at the same time, there's a bracing because, whoa, this, this, this is a big, bad world, or this is a big, bad experience. I'm co-dysregulating now with other people's pain. And I, I guess I get fascinated with our, I'll ask you all what you think. Is it bonding, like, you know, trauma bonding? Is it a form of bonding to co-dysregulate? Um, and if it is, or if it isn't either one, uh, why do we think when we're co-dysregulating that we're enjoying it? Why do we think we're enjoying, like, you know, there's like that friend that you cannot call something good's happening. <laughs> we all know that friend. <laughs> you can call and be like, oh my God, I just took a bath and life is perfect. Like they can't. No, nah, they don't want to hear that. <laughs> they want to hear, that. what did that bitch do at work today? <laughs> Let me tell you all That's about right. it. <laughs> yes, there's like something horrible happens. You're like, I know exactly what I'm going to call right now. So I'm curious about that. What does that look like? Hmm. Well, I had a really salient example or, um, yeah, example of this happened with me during COVID. Mm. So first month of COVID happens, you know, we're all, um, you know, staying in our houses, not interacting with people. And I was watching 24 hour news, 24 hours a day for about four weeks straight just watching the numbers tick, tick, tick up and down. There was no new information, watching the press conferences, this specialist, da, 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 da. And there was somewhat of a level of connection, like, okay, I can see, you know, like other people talking about this, they're experiencing this with me. And it was also a means by which I could, I would say, I could say activated and like this sort of ramped up made me feel safe in a situation where there wasn't a lot for me to do other than just shelter in place with, with my mm -hmm. husband and kids. And so watching that for 24 hours a day for 30 days just kept me in that constant vigilant state um, until it didn't serve me anymore. And mm -hmm. I just had to notice what I, I was getting, I was exhausted. And then I had to really sit with the experience, the trauma we all experienced of COVID. And so watching the 24 hour news channel for 30 days actually somewhat kept me away from the event itself. And then when I removed myself from watching, you know, I still kept up with the news, but not addicted to it for 24 hours a day or 12 hours a day. Then I really had to sit with the experience of who, what is this? What does this mean? Or was this signify for me? What's going on? Um, some sensations I wasn't able to tap into when I was just constantly watching the news. Mm -hmm. What about you too? For me, I'm I'm noticing just how much um which we talk about a lot too, how the activation um is non-binary. It doesn't necessarily have um a strict meaning. Like a lot of times I I find it a lot of times myself that um the same kind of activation I have when I let out a laugh with someone is the same kind of, you know, bracing anxiety. It's just, there's the, there's the story that's happening around it because of whatever experience is bringing it up. So, I mean, there might be a completely different external reality, but uh, internally I, I find them to be rather similar. Um, yeah. And just, and noticing, noticing that. Um, yeah. Love that. How about you, Marika? Now all I'm thinking about is the pandemic. <laughs> it's already working. Like what did we do? <laughs> I know. No, I was just I, I I felt very. My thing is I. 
I've definitely trauma bonded with people over the years. Like that was the only thing we had going for our mm-hmm. relationship. Um, and with sort of doing that with a group or with an identity, you know, that type of a thing, I, um, I like to think that it's because, you know, we heal collectively. And so maybe I'm turning towards, you know, co-regulation unconsciously or something, but then all I know how to do is trauma bond, <laughs> you know, yeah. because I think that the instinct is right to go towards people, right. Um, mm-hmm. Rather than isolate on my own and try and figure, figure stuff out or, um, but that the nuance and the tools haven't, hadn't been there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so now to me, it's, it's good enough for me to notice when that is coming or that that's what I'm doing with that one person mm-hmm. because I know that's not going to actually help either of us. I'm just trying to course correct if I can. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just recently, you know, in the last few years and only because I've seen so many other people through the pandemic and beyond doing it themselves unconsciously and being able to be like, Oh, that's what I was doing. You know, like, <clears throat> It's hard to not want to jump in front of it mm-hmm. for people and be like, I just recently learned this thing and you should learn it too. <laughs> you yeah. Know? I want I want to be able to to help people, but I think really just doing it ourselves and modeling it has been the best way to kind of get out of that pattern. When I think about that trauma bonding with code dysregulation, I think of part of the relief is that these bodies feel really safe in constriction, right? So there's these two people that are talking about something that's constricting both of them. And so they're, they're feeling safe. Like they're feeling safe. Safe is different than pleasurable or comfortable. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, you're in that relationship because it's comfortable. I don't actually believe it's comfortable. When most people go into their body, they're like, oof, this feels horrible, but it's safe. It's known. And there's like a sense of, I know this. And so I'm, I'm also wondering, and uh, whether you want to share your own personal experiences or just kind of riff on it, you know, when I started letting those identities fall away from my body and my mind, and I wasn't looking at, again, just calling it victim identity, I wasn't identifying with that anymore. It's like, I'm, that's not me. Uh, it even got to the place for me where even because someone did that to me, that's still not me. That's something that happened to this body. That's not who I am. I didn't want that, that that's, Weirdly enough, I've come to this place where it had nothing to do with me. It affected me. It has nothing to do with me. It's not mine to carry around and figure out. And so I, I'm saying that because then the weird thing was all this expansion. And I wasn't ready for that. And so I think what's interesting is how do we or how have you experienced from this work, especially moving from co-dysregulating friendships where you're trauma bonding, you're kind of complaining together, that's how you bond to places where there's more silence, more intimacy, more joy, more laughter. Like, what is that like in your lives currently? Um, I have an answer, which is it's been authentic and lonely. Oh, interesting. Tell me about that. But, but I think better, like, because my criteria for, criteria for bonding and connecting is different now. And so that means the people that I connect with aren't necessarily the ones I, I'm used to. You know, mm-hmm. and that there's, yeah. there is a, a th- um, I don't know if it's a fawning thing, but a thing where if somebody wants to do that and I don't, mm-hmm. well, now we're just at odds, you know? Yeah. I'm yeah. Not, Cause like, you're not fawning. Right. And so then it's kind of like, well, end of conversation. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what was it like for you? I'm wondering to be at the retreat where everyone was like authentically relating, you know, even though we didn't ever use that term, but it, it, they were all just connecting in such a deep way. Like, what was that like? Was that good for you? Was it uncomfortable? Like, how was that amount of expansion? Well, it was great because what I don't want is small talk anymore, right? I want to be able to dive deep with people and actually be real and like honest and messy and, you know, mm-hmm. but open to like all of these experiences that I didn't have before, which was like very authentically feeling, feeling, <laughs> period. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and so that was great for me. Um, you know, I it takes me a little bit to arrive somewhere, <laughs> but oh, I know that I witnessed. Yeah, but I, witnessed I did. <laughs> you, you, you arrived very well once you arrived. Yeah, exactly. I just need a couple of weeks ahead of time next time <laughs> to get there. <laughs> but yeah, I I think that it was those are the spaces that I want to be in. 
you know, those are the people that I want to be talking to about regular everyday things and not like, oh my God, did you hear? Mm. Or, oh my God, did you hear the <laughs> terrible news? It's like, I don't want to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. No. I love that. You know, I, I just when you said small talk, I saw Camille's face. She like lit up. She's like, mm -hmm. and I felt it too. I was like, I've never been good at small talk. Never been into it. But oh my goodness, from doing this work, I am so. I am. I'm like out of practice from doing this work. I don't even know how to small talk anymore. I just like drink water and it falls down the side of my face. Like, I have no idea how to like even <laughs> like mimic the small talk. It's supposed to be socializing, right? But it doesn't feel social anymore. <laughs> so it's like, okay. I So now, so it's like I get to, I'm learning how to be social with the people I want to be social. It's just a very weird journey. Totally. A journey. <laughs> it's like a, a mimicking connection when I'm small talking is how it feels. Yeah. I mean, that's to me just networking. <laughs> <laughs> how, do, how do I do that more authentically, right? Have we ever had a network? I don't ever remember networking, HLN. No, no. no. <laughs> I'm like, wait, has that ever happened here? Because I mean, no, if, that's not a term we use. Like, if, never. Those, <laughs> if those of you could see, be a fly on the wall in our meetings, whoo, you'd be surprised we even run a company. You'd be surprised we even run a company. You would probably, yeah, we would get a lot of HR complaints. But I'm HR. <laughs> <A lot> so. <laughs> yeah, you're the HR person. I'll get back to you in nine months to never. <laughs> What are you thinking about that, Camille? Oh, um, gosh, now I'm thinking about networking. Um, you can go there. <laughs> take us wherever you want to take us. Um, oh, yeah, I guess that's what's on. Like. Yeah, networking is just not real connection. And I, I, and I guess for, for me, this, this does tie back to sort of like being in the dysregulated space because we network, we literally have these scripts that we talk about because th that's another form of keeping us safe because vulnerability is a form of expansion just like releasing our trauma response releasing our identity of our trauma is a form of expansion and that is really vulnerable because if this wall comes down now i'm opening myself up to threat and to mm -hmm. harm mm -hmm. and so all these things we're doing we feel is like okay i'm, I'm going to keep up this pretense so that bad thing that happened to me never happens again Right. And for me, I came to a place where I realized, like, I'm living my life holding my breath. And I just wanted to exhale. And so for me, exhaling is knowing that, yes, that thing happened and the dynamics at play are, that made that thing happen are still at play and it could happen again. And if it happens again, I'll be okay. I know mm -hmm. how to navigate it. So, yeah, there is a real possibility. Somebody will stop me in my neighborhood, question while I'm walking around. And I will navigate it should that time come. There is a settling in my body that knows that I will be able to navigate that situation as opposed to constantly trying to live my life in a way so that situation never happens. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and what's so fascinating, right, is when the situation ends up happening, you've built all this capacity to metabolize the charge of the situation when it does happen because you're not living and you're bracing anymore. Yes, and that's, to me, like the real freedom of the way we do this work around oppression, identity, pain, whatever it is. And essentially, all we're really talking about here is remembered and expected threat. That's all we're yes, talking about. That's all whatever we want to call it, right? It's all it comes down to. And so if you're remembering the threat in your bones to the point where your body is unable to feel the chair you're sitting in now, you know, your body is living in a nightmare of what has happened and it's unable to attune to what's happening and PTSD and anxiety and stress, those are all just terms for a body that can't feel where it is. Because what we know about trauma response is it takes over and the mind doesn't have a moment to consider what to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're actually sitting there and you can think, pretty good chance you're not in a trauma response or not, you're not in an actual threatening experience. You're expecting threat or you're remembering it, but right now you're not being threatened. And again, I mean, go back and listen to the episode I did with Camille, you know, with Khadija. It's, it's a perfect yeah. experience of this, like real, real time, actual threat happening to a body of someone she loves that she birthed and still being able to come back to her body. And it's just the kind of like the proof, if you will, of what happens when we learn that we have some, um, what's that word? Agency mm -hmm. in where we attune. 
I think that's really what this is about, isn't it? Like victim identity really comes from thinking you have no agency to where you attune. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, to continue with the Khadija example, um, like even now, you know, she had her experience, cardiac arrest after her first open heart surgery. She's going to have a second one probably later this year. It'd be easy, really easy for me to constantly be in a state of bracing and saying, what steps do I need to take to make sure that she doesn't have another cardiac arrest after mm -hmm. her next open heart surgery? Because I cannot do that again. Versus what I'm choosing to do is to attune to the fact that she's chilling right here in her swing set next to me and she's starting to giggle and uh, she's drooling a little bit on her sparkle onesie and and the fact that we have this time <laughs> together. I don't know. She and she went through it. it. Yeah, she's, she's the one that went through it. and she's laughing and drooling on her onesie right now. Like exactly. right there. The if she can be okay. I can. <laughs> That's right. I can be okay. So yeah, it's absolutely about attunement. You know, bypassing or gaslighting would be like, oh, it happened. Like, get over it. Like, am I? Are there still parts of me that are releasing and and processing that experience? Absolutely. And there's a part of me that can recognize it's not happening right now. Mm -hmm. And again, another part of me knows that even if she does have another cardiac arrest after her next surgery, hell, even if she does transition, she dies. She transitions from this plane of existence. I'll be okay. I will be able to navigate that. Well, you're one of my favorite people in the world, Camille. <laughs> Very few people can say that. Mm -hmm. It's powerful, it really is, because it's it's the truth. It's like everyone listening here has been through some kind of hell at some point in their life, right? And you're here. I mean, that's the most amazing thing about the human experience is this animal body that we inhabit it just knows what to do and so it's like we 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 survive these experiences but we have the difficulty attuning to the survival mm -hmm. and i i love the example that martha beck uses a lot she was in on in a safari in africa she was africa a lot and she was watching <clears throat> i was like a predator chase down like like an antelope or something i don't think there's antelope there what is it called um <laughs> gazelle yeah the gazelle is right and she was watching the, the lion hunt the gazelle and the lion got really tired during the hunt and like sat down exhausted and the gazelle literally stopped like a hundred feet from the lion to start eating grass and i'm like right there it is like that animal body knows how to tilt the predator's done i see the predator there i'm gonna eat some grass i'm hungry now that's amazing to me so these animal bodies know how to do that it's just about facilitating it The other thing that comes up for me is it's somewhat similar in that um, I think oftentimes we can get attached to a, a trauma identity or a victim identity. Again, that idea of if I if I cling to this, then that thing will never happen again to me. And that's another form, at least for me, of finding safety outside of myself. As long as that thing never happens, then I'm safe. Mm. And Whenever we search for safety outside of ourselves, it's conditional and never enough. Mm -hmm. So even if, you know, that thing doesn't happen or it doesn't happen to that, you know, you're still constantly on guard and waiting for that thing to not happen. Mm -hmm. And so you never really get a chance to just actually be present in the moment. Because again, it goes back to that. If I have safety inside of myself, then even if that thing does happen, I can navigate it. Mm. Yeah, I love that. You know, I was thinking of... Um... Africa Brooke is someone I really love. I don't know how many any of you know her, but she's I've been trying to get her on the podcast for so long and I that got that close and then she wasn't available. <laughs> but we're gonna keep trying, we're gonna keep trying. She's following me now. So once someone follows me, that's always a good sign. They'll come on. But <laughs> Africa, if you're listening, please come on the podcast. I want to talk on. to you. Go get on here. But um she posted something that was like, what did it say? It said, like, life is so much more beautiful when you live it as if you've already been canceled. And I was like, yes, <laughs> like, there it is. And and it, I was thinking of life before social media. Like, you know, if we all think of all of us here know that that's like, I don't know about people listening, but do you remember just that feeling of not even knowing what you were doing was inappropriate or not, which it could have been a problem at the time, but there was this like freedom of just like, no one's going to hear this again. No one's going to see this again. I don't have a business. I can't, I have nothing to lose. There's like this huge amount of freedom. And to be able to live that way, I, you know, when you said what you said, that's how I really try to live life is yeah. as if I've been canceled. And what you just said, 
like um i don't even know what you just said i'm feeling it so much i can't even remember can you tell me what you said yeah uh because i have safety inside of myself even if that thing does that's happen it. i can that's navigate it, it. Yeah. that's it and when i was doing uh, when i was really deep in the work of byron katie and then starting to get into somatics i would like somatically relive the most horrible experiences of my life and again i don't recommend everyone do this because not everyone should or needs to but in the moments of doing that i found like oh my gosh in those moments i was totally okay mm. i was actually okay i was hurting it was scary i would never ask for it but i was okay and it was this amazing sense of wholeness that came in that felt like i'm not broken there's nothing missing there's nothing incomplete that needs to heal there's no healed i'm i'm okay i'm still here and it's kind of like letting those parts be with me throughout all these experiences does for me exactly what Camille just said. These things could happen again. Something horrible could happen again. I know I'm going to be okay. It's going to suck. It's going to hurt, but I know I'm going to be okay. And when we have that inner relationship, to that source of safety, it's really, it, it really, uh, like growing up Catholic, I never felt the Catholic religion. I never felt, I never felt God at all until later in life through nature. But when people tell me things like, you know, um, I just let God take over, you know, like when religious people talk about their relationship to God and how they mm -hmm. just feel so good because they have God. Like, I think that's what we're talking about. It's like, they mm -hmm. feel this internal sanctuary and the source that no one could take away no matter what, what, what's done to them even. And that's, that's a really powerful experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it reminds me of the quota. When you find, um, when you find, when you find God in yourself, you'll find yourself in God, um, mm -hmm. and that has uh, really supported me and, mm -hmm. and guided me through through a lot of things. Yeah. So I thought we could uh, start closing this with just uh, sharing what are our favorite code dysregulators, like what we're like if we think of either currently or past. Like what's our fifth? <laughs> <laughs> we already got it like what's got a, what's it. our favorite thing to do to code is regulate what's yours so my favorite code is regulator and that's so bad i have a lot of shame around it is just ratchet oh, exactly Kabusha. it is a uh, <laughs> ratchet reality tv so like all the housewife <laughs> hip-hop like just horrible horrible and i love it it's oh. so dysregulating <laughs> okay i need to hear what part of you loves like where do you feel the part of your like, oh, I um, love the dysregulation i can i can feel it like right here in my jaw like it's just tensing like i can say mm, yeah girl get her mm, mm, yeah. <laughs> she, she did that no she did that oh my god yes yeah, like all of it is just like right here and i just mm. <laughs> you are making marika live right now she, when she puts her hands over her face, that's a sign that she's just like. So okay. what, what? We can what, hang. Is that your I mean, you one? No, the the first thing I thought was Doritos, but really the thing is, is like, <laughs> is um, that a code dysregulator? No, maybe. Um, I I really like mine's like Camille's, but it's like trashy novels. Mm -hmm. Um, where it's like just, slightly more sophisticated, <laughs> like, oh, yeah. like a trashy Real novel, not a telenovela, but a trashy <laughs> novel. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of those like takes me completely out of whatever life is doing, and it's usually the same like three books that I've been reading since like <laughs> high school. You know what I mean? Which was a hundred years ago. So, yeah, they're really the same ones that always take me right out of real life very quickly, mm, like nice. bathtub beach reads. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. About you, Evan? Gosh, I feel like, well, first I have to drink coffee. And then, I, <laughs> which I, may, might be not a regular. There's a formula. Like, I hear a formula. Yeah, this is getting me started. Um, and then definitely just like the Discover page in my Instagram social media. And it just blasts me with like insane memes. And just, <laughs> just it's flashing and there's loud sounds. There's like explosions. I don't even know what comes up. Some bizarre comedy, <laughs> like things that I can't even describe. <laughs> You know, it's, it, yeah, I think mine is my discover page on YouTube and Evan has seen mine. He, he sends me <laughs> screenshots of it every day, like laughing. It is for, it's like, if you want to talk about diversity and inclusion, look at my YouTube recommendations. <laughs> you can't even oh, imagine. <laughs> I can, and I will not. <laughs> it's like, you have everything that shouldn't ever exist on a page, existing on a page. I love every drop of everyone. 
from the drag queen queens to a Republican reaction video to a car crash, like everything is just being thrown at me. And I'm like, bring it, bring it, bring it. Mm -hmm. Because I, I love to like, I love to watch people. I love to, I love to learn what, why people believe what they believe. Mm -hmm. Like it like lights me up. So part of the code dysregulation is like, whoa, I'm getting like hyped up on their belief. It's like fun to believe it with them for a minute. And then it's over and I go back to my, you know, I take my drag off and I go back to just Luis. I'm like, oh, okay. And that's all just someone's made up idea about the world. And it's like so amazing to jump in and then take it off. Jump out. Yeah, I'm Actually, I, I love YouTube. My husband thinks it's crazy because I love watching people like reaction videos. But it, I realize now it's just reaction videos to things I already love. So I just need to validate <laughs> that other people love it. And then I get to watch them love it. It's very, oh, yeah. it's very cyclical. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love, I love this because it's like, there's this idea of, of trauma specialists and people that do like, you know, the trauma, all we're doing is watching like lectures on trauma. And I think it's <laughs> further from the truth. And it's it's like, I, I've learned so much about humans and trauma and working with the body by taking in information from everything. Like where you shouldn't go yeah. is where I especially want to go. Watch Ratchet Reality TV. You will learn Send a me lot something. about trauma response. Send me something, please. Because <laughs> my the closest I got to Ratchet, well, I grew up on Jerry Springer. That's Ratchet. That's not it the best Ratchet. Any more Ratchet than that. Anything that starts with Real Housewives of, check it out. <laughs> okay. Check it out. All you'll see is a bunch of trauma response. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if I'm compatible. I'll grab my pillow and watch those. <laughs> I'll see how they go. <laughs> okay. What were you going to say, Marika? No, I'm just, I, can you record yourself reacting to the, yeah, see? So, you know what? I have so many times, Evan and I are playing with 2024, like YouTube land. We're going to go into YouTube land in 2024. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I want to do is I want us to be reacting to things that trauma specialists shouldn't be reacting to. <laughs> that's what I want us, and like talking about the freeze response and the fawn response. I think it'd be so fun. I won't be able to talk about it because it will be in freeze response. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You're when Marika was down here. Oh my god, we were driving. We, I never saw you scream in laughter. I never saw anyone scream in laughter. Like we were like so oh, inappropriate, <laughs> like the most inappropriate things. And it was like I think it's how we were. Uh, it wasn't even a code dysregulation. It was like. Mm -hmm what would you call a co a co cocaining it was like we were so activated and like euphoric and it was just and evan was in the back seat he wasn't even talking he was just laughing and crying the entire <laughs> time we were just screaming in laughter it was amazing and um, i grew up with brothers disgusting <laughs> brothers and you guys like blew that off the map <laughs> Well, anyway, when I was 16, my mentor that I grew up with was a, a retired drag queen. She told me all that. So that's why I blew them out of the water. You put okay. a drag queen up against some brothers? Nope. No. <laughs> They're not going <gonna, laughs> not gonna, to not gonna work. Okay, this was really fun. Uh, who knew oppression and victim identity would be fun, but I guess with us, everything <laughs> can be fun at some point. I hope everyone here learned something. Uh, I know I did. And we are now going to hang out with our live audience. Remember, we have a live audience now. So you want to be part of it, join the library membership. And you can be part of our little podcast here. Okay. See everybody. And we'll see you next time. Ooh. That's the end of today's episode. Now let's take a moment to notice where we feel the episode in our bodies. Close your eyes. Take a breath. And let whatever wants to come up, come up. And remember, those sensations hold the wisdom that we're looking for. If you want to go deeper, visit holisticlifenavigation.com.